Thank you very much. I'll let uh, Umberto Belluzzo, director of BIS, uh, the Society of Special Branch, together with LCU, LCU Italian Society, uh, has organized the, the Italian Symposium, for which we thank, we thank everyone for coming. Uh, and so I'll let the floor to you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you to Professor Tortarelli and Professor Bologna for being here at, at this panel. This is the last panel of the 2023 Italian Symposium, and I'm uh, really excited for this panel, to be honest. Um, I don't think that uh, Professor Cotarelli needs an introduction, but uh, for those that possibly don't know him, he's an Italian economist and former director of the International Monetary Fund. Cotarelli has authored several books on fiscal and policy, uh, fiscal policy, fiscal institutions. He's the former director of the International Monetary Fund. He holds a master's degree in economics from the LSE uh, and worked for the Bank of Italy and ANI. He's also a member of the board of the Istituto Affari Internazionali and the Italy USA Foundation. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Together with him, and there will, I'm moderating the panel, there will be Professor Codogno. And uh, uh, as uh, usual, we will have uh, a student co-host to give him a student perspective and will be one of the co-founders of the Italian Symposium, Fabio Carolla. Um, I would also like to thank everyone that helped organizing this event, the United Italian Societies Committee and the, the CSU Italian Societies Committee. Um, I'm really glad that we came to this end. I must say it was really successful, so thanks very much. Uh, and I would also finally uh, like to thank the sponsors for supporting, uh, uh, supporting this event, in particular SDG Group and the Belluzzi International Partners, as well Casa Londra, Magliani and Macron. Thank you very much. Without further ado, I will leave the word to Professor Codogno. And uh, thank you very much again. Okay, so thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. You said it all, so I, I think I don't have to add anything to introduce uh, Carlo Cottarelli. Uh, but maybe I should add that he's a total fan of uh, Inter Milan, and uh, but you know nobody's perfect. So that's, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I think uh, and, uh, Carlo said that he would like to answer questions rather than make a presentation. So I think we jump uh, into into the Q and A, frankly. So. Uh, if I may, I can maybe start with one question or maybe two. Uh, the, my question is, I mean, you have been a, a commissioner for the spending review in Italy, and, uh, and, and then you have, uh, you know, follow very closely Italian public accounts when you were at the Observatory for uh, Public Accounts. So let me ask you whether there is still a place, what is the leeway for uh, spending tax in Italy? Okay, very, no, very happy to come back to London, and particularly to come back to the LSE, although this is not just an LSE event, so very happy to be with you. Uh, the spending review, uh, the forward to this is that uh, I did uh, the spending review, I conducted the spending review in Italy uh, 10 years ago, so many things have changed. So. Um, Many things have been added in terms of spending, some things have been reformed. The, the, the general idea is that obviously there is something that uh, you can save uh, on, on public spending. The question, and, and I, will, uh, I will say a few things about uh, what can be done in which area, which have not changed too much with respect to 10 years ago in general terms. The problem is, uh, the political willingness of doing this. At the moment, uh, there is no interest in conducting uh, a, a, a spending review. Let me understand one thing. What is a spending review? A spending review does not mean cutting spending necessarily. It means uh, prioritizing different pro spending programs, uh, deciding what is uh, uh, particularly relevant, what is working, what is not working. The term spending review was not invented in Italy. It was actually invented here. The spending review is a component of a process of uh, introduced during the 1990s of uh, a new way of conducting public financial management, which is managing the budget. 
uh, something that is based on uh, splitting uh, uh, spending in two different programs, uh, defining for each program uh, uh, what uh, you are trying to achieve, identifying uh, some indicators uh, to assess whether progress is being made, and then every two or three years, you conduct a spending review to see what is working and what is not working. You may have a macroeconomic goal of saving money, but that's not determined by the spending review, which is actually something that was not understood when uh, when the spending review, the, the amount of savings that are that is needed is decided at a macroeconomic level, taking into account macroeconomic goals, uh, managing the economic cycle, taking into account the constraints that coming from public debt. And that sets uh, the, the target, including the possible desire to cut uh, taxes. That sets the target on how much uh, room there is on the spending side. And then once you decided this, you decide which are the, program, the programs that you can afford and the programs that you cannot afford. But it is essentially spending is a way of making sure the spending is, uh, is efficient. And what is not efficient, you cut it, and you can decide to raise other to introduce new spending programs that are more efficient to cut spend to, to cut uh, taxes or to save the money to improve the fiscal situation. This is a bit annoying because it keeps uh, on. <laughs> okay, let's see where this one works. Uh, uh, better. So th that is what the spending spending is. And you do it through different tools, uh, there are different processes, which also you used uh, 10 years ago. You start looking at uh, uh, time series, uh, which uh, the spending was cut in the past. You make comparison across institutions at the same time to see which is the, which, for example, which hospital is spending too much compared to the standards, which local government is spending more to the standard. You conduct cost benefit analysis there. Are all, all different tools they use. But again, the purpose is to find where there are inefficiencies of spending, not necessarily necessary of spending. Having said this, in a period in which uh, uh, the budget constraint is pretty good, because uh, a lot of money is coming from abroad, <coughs> from uh, the ECB, in the first place, from the European Commission. In a period in which uh, uh, the economy is in a crisis, there is very little incentive in conducting this kind of exercises. First, the budget constraint doesn't seem to be present. In 2020, Italy received a deficit. In 2020, for those, for those of you who are not economists, the deficit is the difference between government spending and government revenues. Uh, you spend 100 you, you Taxes are 19, the deficit is, is, is what it is that. And that's the amount, the net amount that you put in the economy. The deficit went up from 26 billion in 2019 to 160 billion in 2020. How much money did we get from the European institution? This big purchase government, Italian government paper to the tune of 175 billion. Another 20 billion came from the European Union. So we got from these two institutions 195 billion when we needed 160. Uh, in that situation, you don't feel the pressure to conduct a spending review. In addition to this, in a situation of deep crisis, remember, always, always remember what uh, Keynes wrote, I think, in chapter 10 of the general theory. Uh, even waste is uh, is okay in a crisis. You throw money in the street, people pick it up, sp they spend, and this puts aggregate amount. So in the period, in, in the period that we have uh, observed over the last uh, uh, two or three years, there was very little pressure on conducting a serious uh, uh, spending. Uh, uh, spending. And indeed, it was not conducted. Do we have, uh, is the, are there any traces of spending review in Italy now? Traces. Uh, you know the uh, so called recovery plan, the piano nazionale di ripresa di resilienza. The recovery plan has uh, some targets relating to spending reviews. 
but they are very formal. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the targets uh, relating to the spending review for which had to be achieved by the end of 2021 was formally the goal was the target was to strengthen the role of the Ministry of the Economy in future spending reviews. That was the target. How was it done? Uh, they appointed a committee chaired by the Ragioniera Generale dello Stato with a member from ISTAT, one member from the Corte dei Conti, one member from the Bank of Italy, that was it. 2022, the goal of the spending review was to announce saving targets coming from the spending review for the next three years. This was done. They set a target for 2022 of 800 million out of a spending of one trillion. Uh, it's not uh, serious stuff. Uh, I don't see anything at the moment in Parliament that uh, suggests that uh, anyone, anybody wants to try something similar to what they did. Uh, I did. I tried to do ten years ago. Now, is that stuff that can be saved? Even about public spending, and, and this will tell you also some of the difficulties. Uh, think, uh, keep in mind that public spending, leaving aside interest payments, it's only three things. Public spending is only three things. You have the government, the state, uh, as a buyer of goods, uh, of goods and uh, goods and services. The government buys. The state buys. Second, you have the state as an employer, the public sector spending for public employees. So you have purchases for goods, purchases of work services, and the third thing is the government that makes money transfers and or writes checks. So this tells you one thing, first of all. Spending a user in a firm as only the first two things. You can save on purchases, you can save on people. And the big item in a balance sheet of the government is actually the transfers that the money that the government makes to people. Ah, good. Can you hear me better? No. <laughs> <laughs> and at least we don't have the, the, the annoying me. It's better if I do it just. Uh, just yeah. out. Could you hear on the. Can you back? hear me there? Yeah. <laughs> so you realize what well, a normal firm becoming more efficient means a saving in purchases and saving in people. But the government, where of these three other items, the third one is the biggest one. Becoming more efficient uh, means uh, writing checks more rapidly, so it means spending more. So the, the, let's look at these uh, three. The first one, uh, purchase of goods and services. You can do two things there. You save uh, uh, in the price at which you buy things. And that's the very thing that was attempted in 2014 with my spending review. And for, to some extent, that was the only thing that worked. And it was done by uh, buying wholesale rather than, than retail. We set up uh, uh, 30 centrali d'acquisto, I don't know what the term is. <laughs> Agencies that buy goods for the public sector. There is the national one, concept, and then there are regional ones. That worked. Some saving came out of this and it's still coming. The, they published recently an assessment of the savings that were made through this concentration of purchases, and there is some there are some some gains. You can also reduce the amount of goods that you use that you buy. Now, if you do it, uh, if you want to do it without cutting services. You what you need to do is to reduce the work, the apparatus, the, the, the workers. So instead of having, for example, 8,000 local governments, you put them together, you save on uh, rents, you save on electricity, things like this. This is a thing that was attempted. It still needs to be done at all. This has not been done. We still have too many local governments. We still have too many offices of the central government in the various provinces and all that stuff. Uh, people. People, again, you can work on wages or you can work on the number of people. 
working on wages uh, uh, in terms of uh, we focus very much on the on the top level uh, which is not uh, not too many people and we had actually we put a ceiling on uh, the, the maximum amount of salaries of uh, of uh, uh, the agent publishes the public sector managers based on the comparison with other countries that's the other powerful tool is to make comparisons with other countries uh, but uh, really, these are not big numbers the public employment has been reduced through attrition however mostly uh, and it's mostly been in a, in a linear way without trying to identify say the local government that went to many people and the local government that had not enough people so was done in a rough way and again in order to make uh, improvements you need to make uh, structural changes in the public administration then you have the biggest item which is transfers transfers uh, the problem is uh, it's not a matter of efficiency you have to decide uh, whether the money that you give to some people is uh, can be justified on general interest grounds. Of course, the particular interest ground that is always, uh, nothing is wasted. For the people who receive the money, there, it's always good. But the question is, uh, are you satisfying a general interest or not? And we know the biggest item there is uh, pension, that's of spending for, for pensions. Would I meet at the time some proposal essentially uh to for uh, at least uh, for the pensioners uh, remember what the threshold was uh, above a certain threshold to reduce uh, the multi payment uh what the government is doing now is doing this through inflation if you do if you try to cut spending for pensions by cutting the level the nominal level of spending you have one illusion works and people don't complain too much if the pension is eroded by uh, by inflation instead they complain if you cut the nominal amount of, of the pension and this is working in a pretty powerful way the government is saving about a few that is two and a half billion which is more or less was the goal of the spending review at the time just to inflation by stopping the indexation of of of, uh, of, uh, of pensions. So that's basically the situation. Um, not very hopeful that something will change. But if the government wants to cut uh, taxes, they will have to do something. Uh, the big uh, the, the pension, the the fiscal reform, the, the tax reform is coming soon before the because uh, easter so we we'll see what that have what we we'll see what uh, the uh, the targets for reducing taxes uh, is but we have to find some way of financing okay so thank you very much i think we have a better grasp of what this spending review is all about now and we also got to the practical example of the mics so that's uh, illuminating and we also know that uh, Inflation is a blessing in disguise, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, which for public accounts, no, no, <laughs> not for others. I mean, uh, I want and sometimes the feeling that uh, Italy worked better when there was inflation. In one sense, <laughs> you know, uh, when you have an economic system where prices are very sticky, prices and wages are very sticky. If, you, if there is an economic reason to change relative prices, you can do it in a country where the ridiculous only through inflation. Because people are willing to accept cuts in real terms through inflation. They're not willing to accept it through cuts in nominal items. And uh, if a policy mistake is made, it's much easier, therefore, to correct it when there is inflation. Because you simply don't have to do anything. Uh, one big issue, as you know, is the reddito di cittadinanza, the minimum guaranteed uh, income. Uh, 780 uh, euros per month uh, for singles. This has been cut uh, by an accumulative amount of about uh, between 2021 and 
and 22 it has been cut by about 15 percent 15 60 percent if somebody had proposed to cut the nominal amount of uh, parent by 15 percent would have been a revolution <laughs> the power of uh, monetary revolution okay thank you i had other questions but i think it's time to open up so i would propose to go one by one okay which is easier so who's gonna answer that Go ahead. Uh, yeah, if, if we have a, I believe we have a, if I may, just one question. If we, Please, go ahead. we were talking before uh, we had the opportunity. Yeah, I, I quoted that Feuerbach once said that God, it's population that creates God and not the other way around. I want, uh, making an analogy, I'm curious to know is it the politicians that make the population or is it the population that make the politician or at least the case for you? Uh, I always said that. The problems, uh, we, we often complain about the politicians. But first of all, we elect the politicians. And very often I see in the politicians some general problems that I see in the Italian population. Now I'm saying things that will make sure that I'm not re-elected. <laughs> I'm not uh, searching for re-election as I'm sort of involved by politics. Uh, no, so you see, uh, the problems of uh, the Italian economy, I don't think they are due to mismanagement in the sense that uh, uh, the leaders, uh, who, those who are guiding uh, people, they were elected. They were selected because they had cer certain uh, features. Italians could have elected somebody who wanted to reduce uh, uh, bureaucracy, somebody to have wanted to have more transparency, something who care the fiscal accounts. They elected somebody else. They elected those who promised the uh, radio digital and what a check. Uh, the good thing about Meloni is that she didn't really promise much. <laughs> and and uh, sometimes uh, in the last election many complained that uh, you know uh, the democratic party did not have a program it was just attacking the right there was no agenda it was not true there was a program you may like it or not there were things that were proposed uh, for example the the 14th uh, the quattro tricesima for the pension and stuff like this uh, cuts uh, to on on the uh, the tax, uh, the burden of the of taxes, cumio fiscale, tax wage on the middle class. The Partito Italiano did not have, in, particularly in the economic area, major proposals. Compared to what had happened in 2018, when the two so-called populist party at the time, the Lega and Cinque Stelle, they had the cittadinanza cosa c'è. And she managed to win simply because uh, people were just dissatisfied about uh, she was new. Okay, she was the one who had not been in government for a long time, and she won just because uh, because of this. As I was uh, joking before, how many of you do you know Yanachi's song? Vengo anch'io non tu no. You know the song. <laughs> Okay, at one point he said that uh, gridare al well, I cannot translate this. <laughs> gridare al lupo al lupo e scappate il leone per vedere di nascosto l'effetto che fa. And it seems to me that people in, in the last uh, 10 years have been uh, voting per vedere di nascosto l'effetto che fa. But, uh, like in the case of uh, the election of uh, the primary and uh, <laughs> And that's the result of 20 years of local of zero growth. That's the result of 20 years of zero growth. People want something new, something that uh, that uh, gives you hope of having something. And then after two years, uh, the new is no longer new and there is a need for change. So then why, how do you explain? First we have uh, Renzi, then we have uh, Grillo Cinque Stelle, 
for some time we had some media now it's uh Melanie's uh third. who's that i don't know <laughs> and there's a good expression in english crying wolf but uh interesting. the person over there could actually answer me okay hi um during these days we talked a lot about bureaucracy and slow judiciary system especially yesterday we on red man order and in many of your books you actually talked about the problem of bureaucracy, the problem of law and judiciary system. Do you think that this government is doing something useful in that direction? Do you think it's a major promise? On bureaucracy, but on bureaucracy and like the, making the judiciary system faster and more efficient. Um, okay, the problem is there. You had no view yesterday, I understand. So I told you that they are doing great things. So. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> I think two things to say. The budget law was a uh, sort of continuation of the Ravis policies. There were things that were bad, uh, I didn't like them, but including the tax amnesty, uh, including the flat taxes, some further movement towards the flat tax system, but we were relatively small. And there is no doubt that this, from a fiscal perspective, this budget was a cautious one. They didn't have to, they decided not to have too much money. It was even tighter than uh, the targets, as the budget targets were tighter than the targets had anticipated. Uh, if you exclude interest payments, interest payments went up, but they went up because of inflation and inflation was eroding the value of public debt in circulation. So in spite of higher interest payments, there was a big gain for the government uh, from coming from inflation. They decided not to spend it and to have even if the part of the budget without interest payment was even tighter than what had been anticipated by targeted by Draghi. Draghi had the primary deficit, which means a deficit without spending of 0.8% of GDP. Uh, this budget, has, uh, which has been approved, was a zero at zero point four percent of GDP. So it's been tight. Uh, a small parenthesis on this: uh, these targets were approved by everybody in parliament, including the, the, the Democratic Party, except the Five Star Movement and the Sinistra Italiana slash Greek. So, in a way, it's difficult for the Democratic Party to complain about the tightness of this budget because uh, it was voted uh, when uh, the so-called nota di aggiornamento al documento di economia e finanza was approved in September, it was voted by the Democratic Party. So, the budget is tight. Uh, this did not uh, give much room to do something new, so we had to see in the next few months. The biggest thing that is coming up is the tax reform. So that's really something that uh, it's uh, it, it's like the signature of this government. Because the other thing, the uh, form of legislation, the judiciary, uh, is something that was inherited from uh, Draghi's government. Now they will make some changes. There was a need for a need of changes, uh, particularly for for the penal uh, criminal law. Uh, what Caldavia had, had done was not perfect, but uh, the train has left already the station. They just need to implement it. We'll see whether they will implement it with enough uh, willingness of uh, bringing down uh, the length of, uh, of trials. By the way, for the first time, we have a specific <laughs> target for this. The target specific is very late. 2026, we have to reduce the length of uh, commercial law or civil law trials by 40%. With, but uh, the, 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 the reform of uh, the tax system is something that is very political. There is nothing more political than taxes. That's the very reason why the Draghi's government failed to have uh, a tax reform. They attempted one. They had the so-called legge delega which was, however, very vague, except in one respect, uh, the reform of uh, real estate taxation in uh, Catasto. And they fell on this. 
And why? Because uh, it was a government of broad coalition and there is nothing more political than taxation. This government has a chance of changing the tax system, but of course it will be uh, a change from uh, uh, made by a center-right uh, government. So we have, we have to see. Uh, the guy who is essentially in, in charge of this is not the George is the deputy minister Leo. I work with Leo. I was uh, for about uh, four or five months, I was head of a commission tasked uh, by the Association of uh, Commercialisti, what's the word for commercialists in yeah. English? Accountants. Okay. Uh, and uh, one of the members of my commission, I was heading this commission, was actually Leo. And he's a very good guy. He has a strong views about, uh, about um, taxation, about the flat taxes, about the so-called quotiente familiare, which will taxes on the basis of the household and not on the personal level, which is very bad in terms of gender changes because it, it, it makes it more difficult for women to enter the, the labor market because the marginal rate will be higher if you tax the household because the husband usually has a higher tax than uh, a woman that enters the labor market. We have to see what comes. It, it should come before Easter, and that will be the biggest, uh, the, the, the signature product of this uh, of this government. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's start from the back. Uh, the lady there, and then and then your 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 phone. Good evening. I was wondering what would be the ideal financial reforms that you would expect or hope for this April. Thank you so much. You mean tax reform? Yeah. Yeah, but there's no point in it. You see, the, the, big, the biggest problem is that when you're in your position, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's very disappointing. You keep voting, you always lose. You, you lose every single vote, any single amendment. Anyway, no, the for me, the most important thing that is needed is the simplification of the system. I don't think there is a huge need of shifting from uh, uh, taxing uh, income to taxing consumption, all that stuff. And kind of, the system is still is just too complicated. And it's too complicated because uh, the tax code, uh, let's say, the, let's take the personal income tax code. Every year, the Agencia de Retrate, the tax agency. It must see. It must see. IRS, I'm more American than the IRS. And it uh, comes up with the instruction for uh, IMPF, which is the main uh, personal income tax uh, in Italy. And it is uh, something like every year, 400 pages long. <laughs> And every year becomes longer and becomes uh, with more, uh, more provisions. And the reason is that it's very simple. Every government feels uh, the need of showing that they are doing something in favor of this sector, this other sector, this activity, this other. And because the money is little, not only they give uh, a, a tax break to somebody, but they also make it complicated to get it because there is not enough money. So you can claim that you have given a tax credit and benefits on sector, but then you restrain it by making more complicated the, the management of this uh, tax uh, benefit. And so things uh, have been piling up. However, it's not just a matter of the simplification. It's not just a matter of uh, somebody who keeps things and change it with your words. No, you're changing the substance. The big difficulty has always been uh, in, in cutting these uh, so-called tax expenditures, being that you, you are hitting a certain sector or a, a certain activity. So far, nobody had the, the guts uh, of doing it. Uh, this government uh, may attempt uh, something uh, in combination with introduction of a real flat, flat tax. The story has always been for them that with a flat tax, the flat tax would come with the elimination of a number of tax breaks. Now, of course, you can simplify the system without having the, the flat tax. Uh, you can do it, but politically, from a political economy perspective, perhaps the only way to 
get rid of these tax breaks. Now there are, are hundreds and hundreds of these tax breaks. Maybe the only way is to offer something in exchange. So you got uh, you have a flat tax at a low level, fifteen percent. Uh, we see whether they attempt doing this. This was not in the program of Fratelli Italia. Fratelli Italia only had the incremental flat tax lasting for one year only. The Lega, Lega, no, the Lega had a real flat tax, 15% uh, for everybody to be implemented within five years, and it would cost 60 billion. So, uh, oh, the simplification is uh, you know, going back to the question what is really needed. But simplifying things uh, is politically very, very difficult. The other priority, the other big priority is fighting tax evasion. The two things that go partially together, but they are not the same thing. The, why perhaps this government will be able to simplify the tax system? I don't have any confidence that they are doing anything about uh, tax evasion. A good example of this was the budget bill. You see, I gave th three speeches so far in Parliament. I will do my fourth one next week. Uh, the most uh, successful one was the third one. It was about uh, budget uh, and particularly uh, what they are doing in the, in the area of tax evasion in general tax policy. Uh, what essentially told is this. They had, this government had sent to Parliament just a few days before sending the budget, a report of tax evasion. It's a standard report. It's done by law, according to the law, every every year. And this, this report showed that uh, tax evasion was still about uh, 100, uh, 100 billion a year, 5% of GDP, very unevenly distributed on uh, uh, the dependent employees, uh, Dependent employees and laboratory dependent. The tax evasion was about 3% of income for the self employed, according to this report, which was the government report, which was the government report signed by Meloni and Giorgetti. 66% or 67% was the evasion by the self employed. So, what I told uh, the Senate is that if I had been the Minister of Finance, who receives a report like this, the first thing that I would do is to call the best experts in the area of tax evasion in Italy and tell these guys to write me a big part of the budget bill on how to solve this problem. Instead, there was nothing. What I found in the budget bill was a tax amnesty. A tax amnesty that for the first time, Normally, with a tax amnesty, you get some money. No, in the, in this tax amnesty has been done, and the implication is that uh, in the first year, this year, you lose 1 billion, 1.1 1 .1 billion, because the Ragioneria essentially said that some of the money will come, you cancel the uh, what to be to be paid, and so you lose 1 billion. So this, I think, made me lose any confidence about the willingness of this government to fight the tax evasion. There was one measure about uh, tax evasion, which may have been uh, right. What was it? It was to fight uh, the, the partite IVA, the VAT accounts uh, that were open and closed very rapidly because they say these are done by immigrants. Fine. So the immigrants, uh, they play these tricks. They, open a, a VAT account, they get some tax credit, they don't pay, they disappear. It was fine, but it was the only thing. And so I don't think much is coming in this area from this law. Okay, the gentleman over there, and then, and then I'll go there, and then uh... Yeah, thank you. Um, you touched upon earlier on, on, on sort of public procurement, and you mentioned about opening up some agencies, consortium to sort of find joint procurement opportunities. Is there any area, given that public procurement is roughly, for me if I'm wrong, 10-15% of, of the GDP, um, is there any other areas of efficiency that can be found in this, in public procurement, in the way in which government 
The third chapter is about uh, the financial sector liberalization that started in the 80s and 90s and to some extent caused the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. The fourth chapter is about globalization. The fifth chapter, globalization, the dream of globalization. The fifth, the fifth chapter is about uh, uh, the dream that technology will free us from the need of working. The ICT technology, robotics, all the stuff. We spend our time just thinking about uh, how listening to music. And instead, what we see that in spite of the ICT revolution, productivity is slowing down. The last 15 years uh, were characterized in the frontier countries, the United States. I'm not talking about productivity in Italy, I'm talking about the United States. Productivity has slowed down. Why did it happen? Then uh, the sixth chapter is about the dream that by cutting taxes to the rich, everybody will become rich and the flip on down economics. And the last chapter, the dream is a growth without ends, endless growth, which crashes against the constraints set, set by environment. So we'll be ready on half of May. Night, please. <laughs> okay, I have the lady here at the front for the. Okay. Uh, you thought I don't want to do pol politics because uh, no, no, generally yeah, in the yeah. economy, the politics they take the vote. I want to talk about economy. You talk about <laughs> reddit of the cittadinanza, yeah. and uh, we see that uh, before we compare other states, I'm not an economist, I come from the private sector, but if we see the, the richer state are the state that they have a social economy, like in UK, we can see Scandina Scandinavia as well. Uh, do you think from an economy point of view, if they cut the reddit of cittadinanza, that leave you know, the power, the d'acquisto, no? the power of purchasing, that mean the movement of the economy. Do you think that the Italy will be better with the economy or worse? From the point of economy, I'm not. I'm not yeah. doing politics. No, I, mean, so. I always argue. It's the people for it. It's not just not just an economic measure. Education is a social measure, first of all. But so I have to let me talk about this from both perspectives. I always felt, uh, and I always been saying that. that Cittadinanza a minimum guaranteed income because that's what a cittadinanza is a minimum guaranteed income was a good thing for it. It was everybody, almost all countries in Europe had it, and it's simply a matter of uh, in a country that is relatively rich, nobody should, nobody should stop. Nobody should stop. The question is how the Rede Cittadinanza was implemented. And it had uh, two major problems. And it's not what you usually hear from others that, uh, you know, they try to achieve uh, to protect the poor. They also try to reform the labor market. I don't think that was the main problem. There were two major problems. The first one that uh, the Rede Cittadinanza was uh, fairly generous for singles but not enough generous for house for people with children. And why did it happen? Because when, uh, before the election, the five-star movements had put forward a, a, a design of the Radio Cittadinanza that cost 15 billion. They come to government and there's not 15 billion. <laughs> and you don't have enough money. There was not enough money available, but you also had the Portacento to pay. And so they decided that uh, there were only seven and, a half, seven and a half billion. Because of this, there was, however, one thing that they couldn't change. The anchor was 780 euros per month for singles. Okay, and that was supposed to be much higher for households with kids. But because there was no money, they lower the equivalent, the scale equivalent. So that became the case of a big distortion. The other big problem, the one which is politically much more difficult for me, because uh, I mean, the other one was good. You solve that problem by giving more money to the house. So the other big problem, which is more difficult to address, is uh, that uh, is this: what was the goal of uh, the Reddit Cittadinanza? 
to raise everybody above the poverty line. Okay. The problem is that the poverty line is very different in intercourse Italy. There are differences between small towns and big towns, there are differences between the north and the center and the south. And these differences are certified by ISTAT, which computes the poverty line in euro terms for large, medium, small cities, and from the north, the center, and the south. And I don't know why, but until uh, last year, you could actually go, there was a uh, not an answer. There was a way in the police that you will go there and give me the, the minimum income necessary to live uh, in uh, Milan. Uh, give me the minimum income to live uh, in uh, Catanzaro. And you got a very big difference, big, big, big differences. And of course, uh, this would imply that you need to link uh, the edition and the answer to the place where you live. Which, by the way, is what is done in other countries where these are subsidies to the poor, minimum guaranteed income, are measured at the local level. Because at the local level, you know what uh, the cost of living is, you know the availability of public services. That needs to be taken into account. Probably public services are weaker in the South, you need to take this uh, uh, into account. You, you know the labor market condition, the local labor market condition. And in small time, you even know who the poor are. Or the poor is. Um, and so these things need to be managed locally. So that's in a way as a third problem with the uh, transition alliance how it was uh, implemented. And gentlemen of the back. <clears throat> Hello, a more personal question in your um, career. So you, you mentioned that you are also a politician, not like just an economist. I remember in 2018 you came with your famous trolley to the Quirinale and everyone was talking about that and then you disappeared from politics for a while. And then in 2022, they wanted you as the governor of Lombardia. Maybe you said no. And then in November, you became a deputado. What made you as an economist, as a professor, undertake this journey? And why with the Partito Democratico, you know, for a more democratic, progressive Italy, which was their slogan this year, and what do you think of the new way with Elish line that is may possible to happen? Okay, so um, let's go step by step. So I'll tell you my life in the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I came back to Italy from the IMF at the end of 2017 with one goal to be a preacher. I wanted to spend my, the next few years by trying to explain economics to the broader public. Because of this, I started going on TV, television, became quite popular. And perhaps uh, because of this, and because I was felt, uh, I was felt to be quite balanced, I was asked by Mattarella to try to form my government. That was my first uh, appearance uh, in the political arena. Since, since then, I became, uh, was called, I was the Reserva della Repubblica. Okay. And so you ask me why I entered into politics because you have a self titular, definitely. You have a self titular, I have to try to do something. Otherwise, I always sit there and comment on what others are doing. My intention, actually, not, not my intention, I was approached about uh, two, and a year, two and a half years ago by the Democratic Party, and at the same time by Azione, in parallel, independently, to say, we'll see whether we're interested in running for governor of Lombardy, president of Lombardy, if I would say governor of Lombardy. I did not say yes, but uh, I started working on this. And when I left uh, for the summer vacation last uh, summer, I decided to spend July and August writing the program for the election. So I was, uh, I essentially decided to, to run for Lombardy. And I realized that there was indeed a lot that could be done to improve the management of the public sector in, in Lombardy, particularly the health sector, which is the main responsibility of regions, and also local transportation. Then uh, the government, Draghi's government collapsed. And, um, you know, I worked a lot uh, to uh, 
be sure that the Democratic Party and Azione and uh, Pure Europa would go together to a coalition. That yeah, seems to be okay. It did not work out. There was a breakup uh, at one point. At that point, I was asked by Letta to run for the Democratic Party because clearly because uh, there was a need of covering that part of area. So uh, I was uh, play. I was uh, on the right side of the center left coalition. If you know soccer, I was the number seven, Lala Destra. <laughs> Of the, of the coalition. Uh, and I was uh, my, I was presented both, both by the Democratic Party and Pure Europa. And actually the announcement of the press conference was made in Pure Europa headquarters, not in Partito Democratico headquarters. But uh, clearly being the Democratic Party, the biggest member, member of the coalition, I was uh, seen as the candidate of the Democratic Party, and indeed I was elected as a capolista del Partito Democratico in Lombardy, which essentially made sure that, uh, I often say it, even a goat would have been elected and been in that position. Uh, after the elections, however, I tried again to, um, to make sure that I would have, I uh, still wanted to run for governor, after I was elected, so it's a bit different for the way it, it, uh, and it seemed that there was uh, it was uh, possible to have the support of the Terzo Polo and the Democratic Party. I won't get into the details, but then until the last moment this seems to be possible, then eventually the third Terzo Polo decided to support Moratti. And so at that point, at that point I gave up because uh, I didn't want to run uh, just uh, for the Democratic Party because uh, I'm not a, a socialist, a social democrat, I'm a liberal democrat. So I would have characterized myself too much as a social democrat rather than a liberal democrat as I am. Now I'm in the Senate, I'm not part of the Democratic Party. Uh, I'm in the Democratic Party group uh, in the Senate, and on some occasion, I, I, I use my independence uh, to take different views. For example, when the government decided to put major constraints on the uh, super bonus uh, for 110% of the tax breaks for renovating uh, your, your, your home, uh, I said it was right. The line of the Democratic Party is that it was wrong. You know, another example is this decision to let the discount of the excise taxes on gasoline and gas oil expire. I said the government was right in doing this. Uh, the Democratic Party decided. So from time to time, I take uh, different uh, views. On the election of uh, Elie Schlein, uh, clearly she's moving, most likely she's moving the Democratic Party further to the left and closer to the Pakistan movement. Um, we'll see how this happens. I don't think that anything, that this will have any immediate consequences, including for that part of the Democratic Party that needs to be more liberal Democrat than to the left, perhaps even closer to the terms of follow. Uh, but, but we'll see what happens. I don't think she will do anything stupid. I think she is a smart uh, lady. Uh, and so she will move uh, cautiously. But if she wants to keep that line, she would have to move the Democratic Party further to the left. Okay. Mr. Yeah, thank you very much. I actually have two questions. One of them uh, is about the monetary illusion. And I was wondering, does that work also for investors? Uh, in a sense that um, I believe uh, Meloni is, let's say, satisfied with what inflation is doing. I don't think they are happy with the interest rates and how they're going. Um, but what what does uh, this inflation uh, um, do to our to the relationship between investors and Italy? In a sense, if I invested in an Italian bond and I saw the Italian government say, "Okay, we're quite happy with the inflation" or some like that message, then we wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't be happy as an investor. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Second, let me ask you for this one. Why I forget that a certain age. <laughs> no, the, in the old days, 
I mean, the old question would have been perfect uh, when Italy had the Liga. Inflation is seen as a European problem. It's an, it's an European issue. I don't think that the investors now would be worried, regardless of what uh, Meloni says or somebody close to Meloni says about uh, the fact that uh, the ECB is raising interest rate too much. Uh, that will, this would weaken the credibility of the Italian government because inflation is seen uh, rightly so as a European problem. Monetary policy measure is seen as a European problem. Um, as, a, as an ECB uh, issue. So I don't think that is, uh, if anything, investors know that uh, uh, inflation has been good for the fiscal accounts. The public debt to GDP ratio last year dropped by about two and a half percentage points because of higher inflation, despite of higher interest rates. So the government lose gains uh, and investors. Uh, the investors are not going to be happy, but if you look ahead, uh, you cannot fix the past. So I don't think that is a major issue coming from inflation for investment. Okay, thank you very much. The second question is more about political responsibility. We've talked, of course, there is a problem of uh, information in Italy. Uh, people are not sufficiently informed. Uh, we've talked about, uh, about it with Professor Fornero the first day of the symposium. Um, However, I don't think we can blame them, blame someone that does, doesn't get informed as much uh, as we do possibly. Uh, for example, I don't blame uh, someone that doesn't know how much uh, the Reddit uh, Italians actually cost it. Um, however, uh, and I think there could be a solution in the supply of politicians that we uh, provide. You know, is there any, do you think there is anything that we can do in terms of what uh, politicians uh, arrive in parliament uh and i was thinking perhaps this is just an idea conjecture like for example um medics uh have to do a test because they have such a huge responsibility over their patients why aren't the politicians having a test uh, before doing so if, if they said if they have such a huge uh, responsibility what do you think any maybe this is a stup stupid suggestion but what, do you think there is any solution to that well, should be not I mean, to come up with a vaccine as well. <laughs> no, I don't think uh, it's very difficult to do something like this. Uh, one, uh, there is one senator uh, from uh, the left uh, who, may, who says things that are very reasonable and he has a uh, licenza elementare, non ha fatto neanche la scuola media. But he says a little about things. And then you can have uh, people with a PhD who says uh, they very unreasonable things. Uh, so when it comes to politics, you cannot really put um, a test uh, in terms of it would be necessary, it seems to be necessary. Well, you know what the difference between the deficit and the public deficit and public debt? Maybe that question could be asked. It was actually asked by one of these uh, TV shows a few years ago. And uh, in a period in which uh, they were discussing the budget, honorable, sapere la differenza tra deficit e debito. Most of the people would just run away. There was one guy who was a bold enough for the difference deficit and debito. We know very well, the deficit and debito sono la, la stessa cosa. Ma diciamo deficit perché ci piace parlare in inglese. <laughs> Uh, so uh, there are things that could be done to improve uh, the uh, credibility of politics. And I've actually tried one, to give you a bit more publicity about what I'm doing. I have uh, written and actually presented already a draft uh, bill that would force uh, political party the political party, based on a 1957 law, they have to present a political program for them, an electoral program. The law does not say anything about this program. So I will simply uh, put one constraint. The political pro but part, political parties have to indicate in their program what is the cost of the measures they propose, what are the offsetting uh, measures, the financing measures, and what is the impact on the deficit. There is no 
So in judging about uh, the stance of fiscal policy, the deficit could be large or could be small. It could have a, a one party can say we want a surplus, it doesn't matter. But you need to put a consistent framework. So now I'm trying to get uh, support from each group. You know how the Senate works, there are political groups. So I have, of course, the support of the Democratic group. I have the support of the Terzo Apollo. I have the support of one senator from uh, La Liga, Garavaglia, who is a very reasonable person. I have approached uh, Fratelli d'Italia, and I'm going to get an answer on, uh, by on Milan, who is Capogruppo, on Tuesday or Wednesday next week. I gave the same appeal to the Five Star Movements. Uh, they will give me an answer. Ideally, I want to have one per group. Then, however, the issue is to push this forward because you present the bill and may die there. You may not come to even a single vote, not even go to the commissions. So then we have to be the willingness of these two, two political willingness. And on this, I count on the public opinion because uh, again, this can go ahead. But this would be simply to, to make, uh, to put a constraint on the political party and avoid uh, uh, unreasonable promises. So you cannot promise that a uh, reddish answer will cost 15 billion and then come to government and say we only have 7 billion. Because you should have known this before. You should have had a consistent framework. And then to avoid that, that uh, these, piece of these promises, these, these estimates are just uh, written on paper, but they are not uh, readable, the Italian Fiscal Council, the official parliamentary village, provide an assessment of whether the estimates are reasonable or not. So that's the way it will work. It will be a revolution because it would prevent a so called promesse de my life. Uh, it will give some credibility to quality and perhaps will help uh, in uh, reducing this huge problem, which is the uh, fact that people don't go to vote anymore. I mean, they're not, they don't vote. Uh, after the Second World War, between 48 and 76, you had the participation rate of the general election was 93%. But constant for all, that, for all those years, from 48 to 76. Then between 76 and 2006, there was a, a decline on average by half a percentage point per year. So in 20 years, 2076, uh, it's on uh, 86 uh, to 2006 in those uh, 20 years was a cut from 93% to 83%. And now we're 63%. So the last, uh, the last uh, 15 years have been uh, terrible. And perhaps people just fed up of uh, being promised stuff that does not, uh, does not happen. One other small thing that I'm trying to do, which is just recent, it happened the day before yesterday. Uh, I put forward a modification to the Senate uh, uh, rules, which is a, it's amazing. The Senate rules says that the default option when you vote is to raise your hand. I want to make the default option the electronic vote. And it seems to me on the 21st century, now it happens that uh, the actual vote with the, the exception of the last few days that I'll tell you about, the actual vote uh, is made electronically. But that is done because every day in the see, in the last 10 years, the Five Star Movement requests that the vote is made electronically. Every day. They stopped doing this uh, two days ago. And so we had to vote uh, the, 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 the decreto on... Uh, Iski, I think it was that one, with uh, uh, by raising hands, and there were something like 50 amendments. And so we, obviously there was no counting. So they say, uh, who votes in favor? Uh, people were there. Who goes vote against? Who's abstain? And the, the head of the Senate was basically not even saying it was a foregone conclusion. Of course, the majority would win, but there was no way of counting the votes. And there was no record of what Carlo Cottarelli would have voted. It's incredible, this thing. So let's see whether this small thing works. But today, it's unbelievable to believe that in the 21st century, the default option for the Senate is to, to vote by hand. It's a very strange thing. Okay.
I mean, going to the back to what you said, effectively we are proposing the talking about uh, talking about the Senate and the Spanish review of the Senate. Uh, I think there is no uh, one of the things that I always do when I go to the bathroom in Japan is to turn off the light. The light is permanently on. So I get, I leave and turn off the light to save some money. When I go back, the light is on again and burn. One will say, well, you have, the, you have electronic sensors, right? So at one point I asked the commissary, but do you have electronic sensors? Senator, they always call you senator, which is a good thing. Senator. Senator, then we have some bathroom with the electronic sensor. Ah, that's good. So finally, you have some savings. So then I realized that in the bathroom with the electronic sensor, the light is always on. <laughs> because the, the, the sensor usually don't work out the TDC, but I, I, I said, oh, yeah, we don't have we a light. It must be dirty. Then the problem is that because of the electronic thing, uh, you cannot turn the light off in those bathrooms. <laughs> So this is to say, again, what to say that uh, unfortunately uh, there is still a lot of waste in the public uh, sector, including in the Okay, no, I was just uh, about to comment that uh, the, the system you're proposing effectively is what has been on for many years in the Netherlands, right? That then yes. they have to come up with proposals and be evaluated by yeah. an independent uh, uh, office yeah. and well about exactly. it. Okay, now I have uh, the lady here at the front, uh, and then let's move to the back. Sorry, I come back to you. Okay, so the the lady uh, uh, that over there. So please go ahead. Hi. So my question. I have actually have two questions, but I'm not sure if we have time. But the most important is, uh, uh, as the super bonus was struck, you know, and uh, uh, economists are estimating that the super bonus has been driving a hundred percent. HSBC said a hundred percent of the economic growth of Italy. I wanted to ask you, first thing first, is it the case? Second thing, second, when can, for sure, it will have an impact on economic growth. And uh, when can we actually see this impact starting? Because I guess that contracts have already been signed, so I don't think that construction company will just be fired. So when can we see the slowdown driven by this? Okay, I mean, a lot of money was spent for the super bonus. If you put together, Super bonus and uh, the other support uh, to the construction sector, so all together, compared to bonds for child, the stuff like this, was 110 billion, which is five and a half percent of GDP. Huge, five and a half percent of GDP. Of course, uh, any money they spent has uh, support activity. It's, uh, 100% of oh, no, I don't think I ever heard that number. I think I, I was the number I heard that I remember something one third of the growth that you had would be to GDP. But of course, the money could then be spent for uh, other activities also mm -hmm. had uh, an impact on, on economic activity. Uh, so the issue there is, uh, is that uh, you had a lot of money to spend and it had an impact on the economy. The question is whether there was the best way of spending the money. And my view is that the, the, the sector needed support. It was good uh, to link the support uh, to green uh, activities, making your house greener, but it was just an exaggeration. Too much money was spent uh, in the same sector. Now, when you spend too much money in the same sector, it means, first of all, that you don't have money of the health sector, which is really being squeezed by, by, by inflation. It's really being squeezed by inflation. And in uh, public education. So I think it was a mistake to put that money. Because you put also a lot of money in the same sector, you are more likely to have more inflation and inflation in that sector. Think because you just put too many resources in the same sector. And it's even worse when you remove the conflict of interest between the buyer and the seller, because whatever you the, whatever the price is, the government pays. Because it's not exactly like this, there were cities, but they were not easily enforced. So I think it was an exaggeration. Conte had been saying that, had been saying this more than once. Has been saying that there is uh, it's not true that prices increased uh, in, in the construction sector more than uh, because of the fight or because of uh, the super bonus, they increased because of inflation. And indeed, and 
Eurostat, this is what the court says, Eurostat data show that the increase in the, of prices in the construction sector has been larger in other countries than in Italy. This argument has been repeated, repeated, repeated mechanically by all uh, five star home supporters, including including senators. And of course, uh, my reaction was uh, what is the source of information? Uh, so, so this information was a report prepared by CNA, which is one association of artisans, their research department. And uh, eventually, I was told specifically by one senator, Pastor Mumi Serato, what was the source of information. And then uh, I, I went to check uh, the Eurostat data. And indeed, we find numbers of this sort. And if you look exactly what they are measuring, they are not measuring the stuff that we're talking about. They are measuring the, the construction cost of new houses. Now, of course, if you buy a new house, there is a conflict of interest between the buyer and seller because you negotiated. So it has nothing to do with the, the, cost, the, the cost of restructuring your house with the money of the government. So again, once again, always be careful about when you find information like this. You always wonder what is the source of information. And then of course you need to go and check the stuff. Uh, I wrote a book on this topic, uh, Academia Papagalli about uh, uh, the buffalo fake news is full of stuff. The, the world is full of crap of this sort. They tell you one thing, but seriously, you go and check. The information was right, it was a uh, error stuff, but it was about something else. You have to be very careful. Okay, lady at the back, then I have here, and then over there. Okay, hello, hi. Yes, so I actually wanted to bring a conversation uh, on a topic that is very dear to me, which is the global climate crisis. And uh, I mean, we all know that this problem has been hitting every country in the world, but we've seen recently uh, this effect, particularly in our country, with many examples the, the uh, melting of the glacier of Magolada, the, the Trane in Ischia, we, we had incredible heat waves in the country. So I wanted to ask you if you think that the Italian government is giving this issue the, the right way, and what do you think are some priorities that the government of Italy should uh, introduce in order to enable greater flows of private investment into green solutions in the country? But the problem is that uh, this government, like unfortunately uh, many conservative governments, are underestimating the risk uh, coming from uh, from the uh, global warming and the environment. It is amazing to see the difference in this area from uh, the 70s. In the 70s, the issue of uh, pollution was a bipartisan issue. The major improvements legislative improvements in this area were approved by the Nixon government between 73 and then the Ford government between 73 and 74. Those were approved by Republicans. This has completely changed recently. Uh, the, the right, the, the US right, and also the European right, for some reason, they are now rejecting the story about uh, global warming. So, what uh, this government has done, for example, now they are uh, not, uh, they are, uh, they are not, uh, you know, there are two big uh, decisions that have to be taken by the European Union as uh, part of uh, the green economy deal, the green deal. One relates to cars, the other one relates to buildings. On the first one, uh, the issue of uh, moving to uh, uh, moving away from uh, internal combustion engines by 2035 and seem to be solved is being reopened. Uh, the Italian government has communicated that they want to discuss the deadline, no longer 2035. On the issue of uh, the residential buildings, uh, everybody should move. Category D by 2030, category E by 2030, category D by 2033, 
that has not even been approved by Parliament. Uh, there will be another, there will be a vote uh, in Parliament by on the 9th of March, I think. But then there are still, and, and although the Minister of uh, the Environment, the Italian Minister of Environment, Piquetto Capir, on October 25th voted for, in favor of this, uh, probably was not uh, realizing what he was voting. And as soon as I went back, he was told that uh, no, the line of the government is different. So we are opposing that. Italy is opposing that one. So I don't have. Uh, now, there is, of course, uh, some need for graduality, uh, some from moving slowly from countries like Italy. We have basically 9 million houses to be renovated. If you do it, if you do it, uh, you end up with saving money on your electricity bills, uh, heating bills, uh, and so on and so forth. But it does require some support from the government. This is something that implies positive externalities if you do it, so it's okay to have subsidies. And it's okay also to split this over time. Of course, there would be nothing dramatic if instead of being 2033 or 2035 or 36. The problem is that if instead it becomes 43 or 45, uh, another objection that is being raised by the right on this uh, is the fact that uh, this is. Uh, there is no point for Europe to do this. Europe uh, represents only 7.5% of emissions. They actually say 9%. It's actually 7.5% of the world. At present, European emissions of CO2 are 7.5% only of the world. So what's the point of Europe doing this? First, you can object to this. First, is that if we move first, we will become leaders in the sector. But most substantively, if you got uh, the use of uh, I don't uh, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, you reduce local pollution as well. Local pollution is a big problem in some parts of area like Pianura Padana, where the so-called polvery sortili particulate, so-called particulate is uh, one of the highest in Europe. I come from Cremona. Cremona is the second in Europe, the second most polluted. Uh, City in terms of uh, uh, particolato 2.5, uh, polvere sottili. Uh, and of course, that affects uh, lungs. And I have some actually, this is some economic work on what explains differences in uh, COVID mortality across advanced economies. And one of the factors is the degree of pollution based on uh, particulate 2.5. So these are stuff that we should do regardless of a global warming. We should do it for ourselves. But uh, it's the, the right has major power on this. They also come up with some funny arguments, like, uh, but look, uh, we need to import for the electric cars. We will need to import uh, batteries from China. We become dependent on China. Sorry, but in, in, in internal combustion engines, what do they, they use oil? Right? Do we have oil? We don't have oil. So we are dependent on our countries. So we should actually strengthen our, as uh, something we can do, strengthen our ability to produce batteries, even the fact that we cannot just produce oil because we simply don't have it. Okay, we are running out of time. So let's combine the two questions, one over there and one over there. So please. We have a question about the European response in American IRA. So how do you think that uh, the loosening of state aid rules on a European level will influence the time zone, given also that Italy doesn't have the same spending power on the Germany and France? Okay. Then over there. Hi. Uh, Italy has one of the oldest population in the world, and uh, in the past two years has been decreasing significantly. How do you think it's going to impact the Italian economy in the future? Yeah. Okay. So on, on the first one, the yeah. are. IRA. Uh, I was told you cannot say IRA because there might be Irish people in there. <laughs> sure that the America did not think about this uh, this issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a bit of a fake news. In what sense? Uh, it's true that the Americans are doing certain things. And the attitude of uh, the Italians has been, uh, look, they are doing this. Uh, we would like to do the same, uh, but we cannot do because of our uh, because we have a tight budget constraint. Instead, Germany and France, they are doing it. It's unfair. We need to do something at the European level. 
sounds right. What is the problem? If you look at uh, what the Americans is doing, <clears throat> we're talking about subsidies equal to 0.1% of GDP per year for, for the next 10 years. 0.1. To argue that we cannot afford the 0.1% of GDP is a bit uh, off. It's true that the 0.1% of GDP, if you put it in the right sector, it does, it may give a, a, a pretty big advantage in some areas to the US uh, uh, industries. And that's why Europe needs to respond. And it has the resources of responding, including Italy. If we're talking about something like 0.1% of GDP per year. On uh, the issue of uh, aging, I promise that uh, we're running out of time to, to, to answer your question uh, in a proper way. It will require one hour, but I'll try to, uh, to give you the short answer. It's a very serious problem. We lost uh, between the end of 2019 and 2021, we lost half a million people of working age because uh, the cohorts that are retiring at birth were of a sort of 900, right? 150,000 people, they are replaced by cohorts of half a million people, and it will become worse and worse over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, in solving this by raising uh, the fertility rate, uh, it's impossible. It's just, uh, it's impossible. To stabilize the population, you have a fertility rate of two. We're current uh, level of the fertility rate in Italy, fertility rate is a number of kids, the, the children per woman. is about 124 at the moment. It's 124 at the moment. I don't know any country that managed to raise the fertility rate from 124 to two. Now, Germany managed to raise it from 130 to 155, and then it started declining again. I don't know any country who managed to, and even if you raise it to, Two, because the number of children for a while keeps declining. Because if 20 years ago there were fewer births, after few, 20 years there are fewer potential parents. That's why the number of kids keeps declining, in spite of the fact that the fertility rate has been pretty much constant at very low levels since the middle of the 1980s. That's when the big drop uh, occurred between the end of the 60s, fertility rate 2.4. Middle of the 80s, fertility rate 1.4. And that has been going up between 1.2 and 1.4. But the number of kids of births keeps declining because of this effect of a long wave of uh, lower births. So the only solution is immigration. Immigration, a regular immigration with permits, more than what we have now, much more than what we have now. I think the government apparently seems to be thinking in these terms. There are raised uh, the permits uh, uh, of entry from uh, was a very low level, 50,000. This government has raised it further to 87,000 for this year. I think we need to go back to, to, to go up to something like 150,000 per year, which is, by the way, the number that the Regioneria Generale dello Stato, the General Accounting Office, includes in their long-term uh, uh, projection for the pension system to see what can be done to keep it sustainable. 150,000 immigrants every, every year. Obviously, what is happening now in, in South, Southern Italy is strategy, and it's, it is not an immigration policy. Okay, I think we are to the, getting to the end. Uh, uh, thank you, you all, for the participation. Thank you, Carla. for the open and candid answers to all the questions and uh, and there have been very very uh, many questions really and some some of them also not easy that's all thank you again and uh, uh, thank you all for your participation thank you uh, professor Cotarelli. thank you professor codogno i just wanted to ask uh, maybe guillermo nicolò to, to, to speak uh, as a final speech uh, of the conclusion of the italian symposium uh, and also Fabio, if you want to, 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 to say something. Uh, 
I'll go first. Uh, uh, again, I echo the thanks from uh, Professor Codonio and from Professor Botel. It is an honor to have you both here. So it's uh, a pleasure and an honor. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you here uh, and to have you had over the course of these three days. Uh, we understand that this one especially has been quite a marathon. We are sure of that, but we wanted to bring the excellence of Italy in the UK, and we're happy to have contributed perhaps to some uh, intriguing conversation. So we thank you deeply from the bottom of our hearts. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you all for coming. Obviously, thank you to the Senator and the Professor for moderating, and thank you to all our guests and to all the people who came to our talks. It's the first year of our symposium, and we're trying to establish a tradition that Italians were missing of dialogue with the students here, and there's a big community. And we hope we're starting a tradition that will last for a long time. And thank you, really thank you guys for coming. Yeah, just quickly, thank you to our guests over the three days. Thank you, you guys, for coming. I think we've had about a thousand people come over the three days, so that's been a great achievement for us. Very proud of us. Thank you to the team, not only us for but you guys in the first rows. I see some faces here and there. Uh, you've done a lot to help, and uh, and we're very very grateful for that. And uh, yeah, as Guglielmo said, this is only the first edition, so too many more. Yeah, thank you very much. And I just wanted to reiterate: uh, United Italian Society is, uh, was born uh, one year ago, and uh, I think we've managed. Uh, quite a lot uh, in this year, and I wanted 